where it's there from. But I'm still a teacher on a, on a university since uh, 20 years already, so you can manage it without, without any PhD work in any house. Um, about the topic, um, I will not want to talk about radioactive waste management. Because it's not a radioactive waste management problem what we have here in Linus. We have here a naturally occurring radioactive material and we have residues after processing them. And if I would take the word radioactive waste management, we would talk about a nuclear power plant. And that's a totally different phase. So we are not in this area, we are dealing with mother of nature and we have material going from mother of nature and we need some materials for certain reason. As Alastair already said, we have so many technologies around in our world where we need rare earths. So therefore we need to process this material from the nature and nature has radioactivity. That's our problem. So that is what I want to address today. Um, first of all, I want to introduce you a little bit KIT, what's Kazu Institute of Technology is, what we are doing, what is our mission. So that's the young students. And this is the reason why I'm looking there everywhere and it sits in the back, in the back sitters more to the young ones. We want to engage the young people to come to us. We have a lot of students coming from China, maybe in future also a lot of coming from Malaysia, because we are very, very open. We have many exchange programs and Germany itself supports it a lot by exchange programs as well. The so next thing what I want to talk on is um, about what is norm and T-norm and what is the regulation in the German regulation um, ordinance. Uh, what are the natural decay chains, change of residues during processing, and analytics of them and real world samples. And finally I want to talk about how to get rid of this, how, what you can do with this. And this is a key question as I understood now since the three days I'm in Malaysia. I arrived on Sunday, so for me it's the first time to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was always a wish for me to come here because I have relatives here but I never managed it to come down here. So that's a very good opportunity for me and the key issue is residues. And what to do with the residues is an answer what Malaysians have to answer. The only thing what I can do, I can show you what we have in regulation in Germany. And what we have in Germany is a radiation protection ordinance, a regulation. I will show you all this in detail. There are examples in what you can do. That's a pity we have no rare earth processing plant like liners. I do not know why they don't come to Germany, because we need this material as well. We have wind turbines building up wind parks because we shut down nuclear power. So we need a, a other place or other possibilities to make energy. So that's what I can do to say you is what we have in our regulations, what we propose to do with such things. And that's not only a problem of rare earths. That's also a problem with glass industry. I have a lot of customers uh, in my lab who send me samples coming from glass industry because glass industry, as you already know, some special glasses need some additives and these additives contain sometimes a radioactive material, that's life. And if the residues become then higher active, they may become later on radioactive waste and they won't be afraid for radioactive waste so they control the residues, the material coming in to know what they get in in the process and then they know what you put in in the process must go out. Same as liners. What you put in must come out somewhere. Uh, and that's the deal. And that's not only a problem of rare earth world, that's a problem which have many industry fields. And therefore that's the reason why we have a regulation in, in our radiation protection ordinance about this topic as well. What is KIT doing? KIT, as you see, the sky has two um, skills on it. One is education, the next one is large scale research. We had formerly been a university on one side, and we had been a large scale research center totally separate, only a distance of 15 kilometers between, uh, for large scale research. Large, large scale re research means investments in millions of euros, means research project going for 10, 20, 30 years, a long time. If we talk about an institute in our research area, we talk about 200 to 400 people. If you talk to an institute and a university, you normally talk about a two or three. <laughs> Heading this, so that's that's the difference. And we had on the other hand the university. Both were very good, and together we are the best. 
that's my boss always telling me. I do my best to be the best, um, but it's very hard to work together a little bit. And since three years we are formed, and what we try to do, we try to bring the opportunity of have large scale research open for the students as well. And that's a big benefit what we have in our education therefore. Just some numbers for you, so you can see we have almost 9,000 employees. Uh, we have 22,500 students roughly. We have almost 400 professors teaching at KIT. We have also professors which are teaching on other universities as well. And we have a very big annual budget. Now coming to the labs where I'm coming from. I'm not half-half, 60% routine work, analytics. It's, I was yesterday at Pehang University and I saw they have the same scale. They have a routine lab running chemical analysis. So I do only radiometric analytics. What we do in our labs is radiochemical analytics and radioactive measurements. And we do this uh, in a routine scale. That means what we do is just mass analysis. Most of the analysis are done for on-site. And I think in the moment 30% for external customers. Even the uh, installations on-site are not all owned by KIT. They are all some external and they can decide where they do the analysis. And most of them do it in my lab, so I'm very happy about it. And I would be also very happy that Linus could send me some samples. I would analyze them for, that, for money. It's not a big deal because we have our accreditation, which is valid around the world. So that's the thing what we did. We did accreditation uh, for our lab because it's necessary so that you can prove that you have a good quality and you have a good quality management. Um, as you see, the numbers what we have on analysis, that's routine analysis, thousands of samples. And if I talk about the sample numbers, what you can see and read by your own, uh, we talk about low level, we talk about environmental samples. So we're hiding nuclides in the environment. We are not working on high activity fields, but we still have a license to work on very high levels as well, because in case, case of emergency, we are one of the reference labs for Germany and one of the reference labs for the International Atomic Agency. So therefore, we have to have a license to deal also with higher activities as well. So how we can bring these two worlds together? Uh, on one hand, rare earth, we learned about a lot. We talk about mass percent or PPM. That's the world where the rare earth people are living. And I'm living in a total different world. Activity, dose. So we have to bring these two worlds together. I'm, I'm talking about radioactivity. Radioactivity is measured in the unit activity. Activity is the decays, and the measurement unit is the becquerel. Most of the world, there's only one uh, country in the world that knows they have a different unit. Jack, that's your country, sorry. They so still have the micro query. I do not know what it is. <laughs> Because it's French, so you German doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I have guessed the same um, answer on a presentation in the US half a year ago. And I just thought I get a, not a big applause. I got a big applause because the most scientists in the US want to have the background as well, but not the industry. <laughs> I don't know what's it. So I will explain what Becquerel is and what we're talking about here. And at the final, we want to have radiation exposure. And that's very important because the exposure is the risk what we take. We can short exposure to risk. And if I go back to Monday, it's a podium discussion, so there was a question if, there, if we do some misleading between external radiation and internal radiation. I want to try to clarify this a little bit today. I had the slide on, on Monday as well on, but somebody maybe did not listen to me or I spoke too fast or in a strange language probably, so I tried once again. Um, if we talk about radioactivity, we talk about decays. Um, if Jack talk about mass percent or something else, uh, he talk about millions, billions, trillions of atoms. I'm talking about one atom is decaying. So if we talk about radioactivity, we have to count the atoms, the atoms which are decaying. So the numbers are very quickly big in Becquerel's, but the mass percents, nothing. That's sometimes less than PPMs. So sometimes you can count really uh, our number of atoms. That's a problem what we have. So that's meaning uh, what we have is the unit is activity and what we're talking about is one change of a core of an atom to other state. 
and one decay per second is um, one becquerel. But what then happens is, if one is already decayed, we have less uh, cores left, left, atoms left. The so activity is time pretending, that means the activity changes versus time. And we measure it in half-life, and after half-life you have only the half of the activity and less and less and less. So activity is gone. Depending on the half-life, the nucleides are more or less interesting. And if you look on geological phases, we talk about thousands, millions of years. So short half-life nucleides can only exist if long-lived mothers are there with feeding them, otherwise they are gone. So if you convert this one, you can have a mass percent, uh, the relative mass percent of uranium in the world is 99% uranium-238. And if you look on uranium-234, it's less than 1%, uh, but the activity is still the same, because the half-life of uranium-234 is short and it's feeded by the mother of uranium-238, so the activity is the same. That's, that's a different world we are living in. So it's just shown here, that's the model, uh, 10 multiplied by 9 years, and it's 10 by multiplied by 5 years, so we have only 10,000 years, uh, 100,000 years below here, and therefore the activity is the same because the decays go in this scheme. Let's talk about dose, the most important thing. We will be radiated. Yes. Every day, whole life, from ourselves, from our neighbors, because radioactivity is in our body, as we are human beings. We need potassium, potassium is essential, potassium con is, contains, since the Earth exists, radioactive potassium, potassium-40. So we irradiate us, us all by ourselves. That's roughly 10% of the dose what we get is by selves. If you're sitting by close to your neighbor, you get more dose. If you sleep together with your um, partner in the same bed, you get a, a whole dose during the night as well. So radiation is dangerous sometimes. <laughs> Um, so those is the biological effect and what we have to separate is the external radiation from outside. That means if I move away from you, I don't get any more dose from you. So because I have only take my activity within my body. But if I have the activity in my body, I get the dose all the time I took in the nucleides. And therefore I have to clarify, if I take in the nucleides by inhalation or ingestion, inhale, get it in my lungs or get it with my food or with my drink, or with the water bottle I just got, there's probably some radioactivity in as well. Um, I take it in my body and it could stay in my body. It must not. For example, cesium-130, cesium is an element which is very quickly going throughout of our body. It's a half-life, a biological half-life in the body from three weeks probably. So it means after uh, 30 weeks, um, cesium is gone. But still the activity would be there, but it's not in my body anymore, so it don't take care of anyone. More way. What we do there is, uh, if the radium cloud will stay in the body, uh, we have to think about what we should we do with the dose. And there's the thing what I want to point out today, in front of the scientists a little bit more, is what happens if Linus releases something? And I get this in my body. I don't think so that I will do it, because yesterday I saw a very good plan, a very good instrumentation, and I'm not afraid for. But what will happen there? If I took in this nuclide, should I take about the dose only just for, for the moment? Because the nuclide, if I took in yesterday, probably there, because there's an activity I could not take in, but even if they are, uh, they are in operation, um, the nuclide is going with me, flying with me home. So what we do there is we accumulate the dose for the next 50 years. Because the nuclide could stand for 50 years in my body. And will you add it me? And we sum it up to one year. So what I get yesterday will be summed for the next 50 years. So that's very conservative way. Because the dose is not exposed in the moment, it's exposed afterwards. But we sum it up for, the, for certain reasons to be sure that if I got an activity input on one place, I can take it with me and I have to take it into account. So that means internal radiation is much more overestimated than this is from external because of the reason we take the radio clots with us. And if we measure everything and calculate everything in millisieverts or in we express it in dose, we express the risk. So extra or, or risk what we get. So that is very important. What should I say about um, radiation protection ordinance, norm and T-norm? I had a very good uh, question coming up shortly in Germany. 
to the Radiation Protection Society I'm a member with. Uh, do we need any Radiation Protection Society anymore in Germany? Because as you know, we will going out of nuclear power. And as in the mind of the German people is, if we have no nuclear power, we have no radioactivity. And therefore the question arised. And I said, well, it was the head of our society, he said, hey, it's a good thing. If you're going out, we can focus on the real dose. And the real dose is not coming from an operational nuclear power plant. The real dose is coming from the environment. And the real dose is coming from medicine. And this is already taken into account in the Radiation Protection Ordinance in the year 2001. <coughs> that's natural occurring radioactivity has the same regulation as man-made radionuclides. Because what I get is a dose. And that's no matter where the radionuclide is coming from. So therefore, the radi Radiation Protection Ordinance take into account both things. Nature as well as um, the rest. But we had always to have in mind, we could not get rid of our Earth. It makes no sense to regulate something down below the levels what we have in the environment. Because the environment will stay there. So just an example, the Black Forest, in which is a little bit south from Karlsruhe, is a very nice recreation area. So people living there live healthy, perfect. But if you pick up a stone there and bring it in a laboratory with a license, you will not get rid of the stone because the stone must be rather refreshed. That's stupid regulations, but that's happened in our radiation protection ordinance. So we have always to think about which level is, is the, rest, the best level to get in our regulation. <coughs> so that means we have this regulation in, since 2001, and the idea is to limit the dose for the workers and to limit the dose for the public. The limitation for the dose for the workers is by 6 mSv, and we, we're going down for the public for 1 mSv. Just comparable, the annual dose, what I receive in Germany as average from nature, is 2 mSv. I get it anyhow. And if I go to medical treatments, it brings me 2 mSv in average extra, so it means I have 4 mSv in Germany. If you live in, in other regions, you can be a little bit higher, or maybe a little bit lower, but that's the average around the world is almost by 4 to 5 millisieverts per year. I mean, one extra could be allowed by processing in a conservative looking way. So it means that's very, very conservative looking. We look always to assume that everything which happened will be done by me. Just one example, if I look on our plant, we have also the regulation for, for man-made radionuclides of one millisievert. And we have to calculate the dose that people get by direct radiation directly on the fence. And the person is standing there the whole year. On our fence, one year, around the clock, he will not go to bed. And where the air is coming down from our chimneys, at the place where it touches the ground, the same person sent also one year. And then all the food, what he got, is eating from the food from the environment of our plant. And this all is done in the calculations, and that must be low one millisievert. So the real exp explanation for the people is much, much lower. That's a factor of 10 or more below. But that's a conservative looking thing. And the same scheme is taken into account in radiation protection ordinance for norm or technical enhanced norm. So it means everything what I show you now with limits are taking into account a virtual person which never really exists, but is on the safe side. So that's very important to say. Uh, what the radiation protection ordinance have uh, for man-made radionuclides is the same scheme what they have also for uh, so um, no material is reduction of dose. Everyone has to take care about to reduce the dose even if they are below the limits. And as I was yesterday in Liner's side, I think that they do everything what they can to reduce the dose. And so think about everything what they can think about in, in advance and I think and I hope they will do the same. I would never say hope as a scientist, but in this case I have to hope because I will not be come back if you are in operation. But I hope you will go further with this and do it in operation space as well. So what we have there is, I will go a little bit uh, faster through this part, is the workers part, which part of works are in the phase for the workers, because the workers have a risk to get more dose than 6 millisieverts. And so if you look at Appendix uh, 11, you find a lot of exposure by radon, but it's mostly underground. And other fields you can look around, you will not find <coughs> something about rare earth. So rare earth workers, 
assuming from the radiation protection ordinance in Germany, and if we have written something in the ordinance, we had a, had a scientific program in advance to make sure that the values are written in there are really the science. It's not written by the government just by this way. Always if we make regulations with values in, we have a scientific program in advance. Scientists make decisions, make reports, make science. And based on these reports, the parliament makes a decision. And the decision is mostly lower than the scientist says. <laughs> That's the influence of a Green Party. <laughs> But if you look at real Earth is not in the list. The problem is protection of the general public. There's a la long, long um, paragraph that's typical for Germany. We have to write down each case and excludings and everything. Or it's sometimes hard for me to read and to understand it then. And even if I ask a lawyer what, what is this meaning, he said, oh, I'm not technical enough to understand what you're writing down there. <laughs> Uh, so we have to look in recycling and disposal and there we clearly find rare earths as we assume. So we have to talk about uh, rare earths recycling and radiation protection and to look about what we have to do. Um, I have to speed up a little bit, I think, <laughs> otherwise I run out of time. So what we have to look is natural decay genes, chains. We have the mother element, what we're looking at, uranium. Then we have this thorium-232. Here's also thorium, but it's a short-lived one of 20 days only, so it's not important in, as a mass of feeding. And we have this uranium-235, uh, but this is only if you have enrichment, a problem, because in nature we have almost nothing from that left. That means the facing is thorium and the facing is uranium. As I learned yesterday and the last days, uh, the problem here in Linus is on the thorium decay. So the thorium chain is more important. Unfortunately, I have not prepared thorium in my presentation specially, so <coughs> I did not recognize it. So what you have to look at, uh, why is it different from the raw material? So difference in the raw material comes from the geochemical processes. So, and if you look on the thorium <coughs> scheme, then we have in thorium the radium here and the thorium decay here. So what here happens, we have this thorium which is standing alone, it's its own chemistry. Then it's coming up here, radium. Radium is soluble in water. And as it is soluble in water and has a long, long half-life, as you can see in here, it's still six years for decaying down to the thorium, it can be diluted and come to an other stone and transported somewhere in geochemical processes. So we have to know that probably the ratio between thorium-232 and thorium-238 is different. And then we have a very quick decay to a stable phase, which is lead. <coughs> if you go on the uranium decay scheme, we have also subgroups. One subgroup is here from uranium 238 to 34. It's here still a little bit life, a half life between difference, so there could be a change between uranium 234 to 38, but I never saw it in my life, so, but it is still possible. Then we have thorium, and thorium chemistry is a little bit different from uranium chemistry. And finally, we have here radium, which has more than 1,600 years life, half lifetime, so there also can happen the same thing that we get a change in geological uh, scheme. But what you have to think about is a process. If you process a decay chain, if you process an element or material which contains natural radioactive materials, we will process also the elements which are in the decay chain. And if I look on the decay chain from uranium, uh, we have here three elements who I have to think about, to worry about. That's this radium. So radium is also in the thorium chain. And that was a question I asked yesterday and I got a prompt answer. So Linus knows what's happening here. <laughs> so that's very, very open discussion yesterday, what I got, and I feel me very comfortable so far. So that means radium is a problem, but because it's water soluble. Then we have a radon gas. And as I heard, radon is here a topic I can't understand. Because radon is gas coming out from a pile, wind takes it away and that's it. And it's distributed very quickly. Radon activities 
in air are diluted very very quickly and then we have no problem anymore and if you think about radon levels I heard yesterday they are below the so calculated 0.000 something Becquerel and just in the moment the World Health Organization is discussing reducing the assumption level for radon in in-house from 300 Becquerel per cubic meter down to 100 Becquerel per cubic meter and if they get calculation numbers with a 0.00 something becquerels per cubic meter is nothing. So if you can have in your living house uh, much more activity uh, which is just in the discussion to reduce it from 300 to 100. We in Germany are not very happy with 100 becquerel because we have many living houses where we have more than 100 becquerel per cubic meter. That's coming from the underground, nature. Then we have the next uh, element which is a little bit critical, but I don't think, and as I understood now, the chemical process, and Mr. Professor Lin would probably uh, say if it's right, is polonium. Polonium is sometimes critical if you recycle ashes. Because polonium can sublime by a temperature of 80 degrees. Polonium to tennis for the people who are smoking, the radionuclide which goes in your lungs. And I already read several studies. One is Polish, one comes from Czechoslovakia, one comes from Italy. I uh, didn't find one in the US, uh, which says that the cancer you get, lung cancer, is probably caused by polonium. Because if you inhale the, the smoke, it's more, more temperatures than 80 degrees, and then your lung is cooling down, and you get the polonium never out of your lung. So it's stored in your lung. So if we control residues, we have to control, of course, not only uranium and thorium, we have also to control the other elements as well, which probably can occur in this process. So fine thing is, as we understood the process well, and there are people, specialists around here, they know how the process working, we have to control it only once at the beginning, and as the process is not changed, we have to we know which look like behavior, the chemical behavior, coming up in what place. So we know what we have to control where. So that makes it a little bit easier, as we understood it one, and if we have a closed process, there's no change, and that's fine. Um, what can we do about uh, rare earths? The thing is, if you look at the radiation protection law, if you're going below 0.2 becquerel through gram, the German radiation ordinance says this is no residue. That means it had nothing to do with radiation protection. You could do with this residue of what you want because it's not regulated in any hall. So if you are below open to back the German law says do what you want. It's not in our duty. <coughs> How to can prove it? Um, and therefore, um, uh, I would say that is what we probably can help the unity of Pehang. Uh, I saw yesterday they are very, very well equipped and perfect labs. They have accreditation. They have very fine places. But I didn't find any radioactivity equipment. <laughs> Probably liners can help them, supporting them to get installed or small labs there and have a cooperation. I'm not sure if it is possible, but they are very close to. Now, if you don't want, you can send the samples as well to me, but uh, I would make the money then with my lab, and I'm happy, but I think it's closer to send the samples to them, but they need to set up a lab. And what I can uh, advise to uh, Penang University is that we already starting to establish a cooperation, and I, as, a super, as the head of this uh, analytical labs, can say we, you are welcome in my lab. So we can train your students on site or I can give you a lecture in, in, in your university. Set as a cooperation what we can offer. Because we know how to analyze this one. Uh, if you have this written already during my talk, you see everything is here very, very clear. The regulation is given, you can read our ISO guidance how to do so. By the way, uh, I'm responsible for this ISO guide from Germany side, so I have to prove or unprove for Germany. I do the vote by myself. Um, and so you get a measurement where you can see the natural radionuclides occurring, you use a gamma ray spectrometer. I will say some few words more, more for some people who are not familiar with this measurement techniques. By the way, to liners, don't be afraid. It's not so expensive. If you have half a million euro, it's about <laughs> two million uh, Malaysian ringgits, then you have a big, a good installed lab. <laughs> so, 
sample, you have put a sample on the detector. Just grab a sample from the stockpiles there where they store the residues. Or bring your water in, which is in the pond I saw yesterday, and I was very happy that they have two control places. So they have one control place where they control the water before release from clarification plant, and then they have a final pond before the release from the final pond to to the environments of the next control place. So that's a very good thing. So you have two times the chance to control. And if you make a mistake in the first one, you can check it on the second time. That's very, very comfortable. <coughs> so you take a sample, put it in a in a container that you have a certain geometry. Then you receive a spectra with the energy distribution of the gamma rays and you cut the number of counts what you get. Then you need an efficiency calibration. So that's just a tricky thing. That is a tricky thing to get efficiency calibration because efficiency from a water sample and efficiency from a soil sample or from a residue is different as it is from, from an air sample and everything else. So therefore you need a little bit know-how how to make a calibration. But finally, if you have everything together, you get an activity report where you see the activity of the samples and it stand of the art. And I got the specs from the air monitor yesterday, what I saw there, and they have a gamma ray spectrometer installed in the monitor as well, so that's a perfect equipment. Best thing you can buy. It's true. I do not know a better thing what you can buy. Because you have an alpha spec in, you have a gamma spec in, there's no more device to measure activity in air. Um, <coughs> what can we measure with gamma ray spec? In the decay chain of uranium, you see, this all green ringed nuclides are very easily to detect by gamma ray spectrometry. So that's not a big deal to measure them. And if you look in the thorium decay chain, we have also several uh, nuclides what we can de detect. I was, after yesterday, a little bit afraid about detect radium because radium has no green ring. But it has a very quick rising daughter six hours time. So if the residue is some days old, it's not a big deal to measure it then across actinium. Because if the daughter raises, you can measure the daughter and you get the mother element. I already showed this on Monday. We have developed a special software for natural occurring radionuclides to measure them with a decay chain. It was a master thesis by an Italian student. Now he did already his PhD work and he's already working for KIT, so we are very happy. We are not always sending the students back. <laughs> we are also sometimes happy to get them, <laughs> long term. So that means it's very helpful to see that the decay chains are in equilibrium, there's no disturbing. That helps a lot to understand. In your case, we would expect disturbed decay chains, and so we will see that as well. So that's what we assumed is really in the truth what we did in the measurement. Just from real world life numbers, how much time do I have left? Uh, five minutes, then ten minutes for discussion. Okay, good. I will hurry up a little bit. Um, you can see that decay chains can disturb very, very heavily, just in the chemical process. In this sample, uh, we have almost no mother nuclides, but only lead to 10. Lead to 10 has a half life of 22 years, and this process separated lead by chemical process. So in, in the waste, we found only the lead. It could also go in another direction, polonium to 10, here was an ash, which is uh, ash which was recycled. And during the recycling of the ash, it's always going back in the process, going back in the process, going back in the process. The lead was taken out, but polonium is still there. And it isn't a worse for sample. So um, that can happen, of course, that the decay chains are disturbed. That's the need where you have to understand. And that's the beginning of such a plan. I would expect to have uh, analysis which goes a little bit more in detail. And if it is running, you just control the hot points. <laughs> because there is no change anymore if the process is running. Um, what does it mean to calculate a dose? I already talked about the dose calculation for our side. Um, I will just go a bit quick over here. It means you have to take all in account the food, what you are produce, the water, what you have, the fish, what you get, the air, which is already monitored, and all the things you have to do uh, with the calculation, because if they, they use this material and spend it in the environment, we don't know what happened with it, so we have to look what can happen with it, which ways it goes, and all the things have to be done in the calculation. So it means <coughs> the sum of the dose must be low one millisievert. So this is a tough work. And if you want to go this way, it would be hard. 
that's a little tough work because then you have to study really for your installation and your field what happens there. And that's a bit complicated. Therefore, the German regulation <coughs> ordinance says, okay, we have some standard cases. And if you are in the standard case, you can escape the hard way for calculation. It. We did it already once for other problem and it was you know, six months work to do all the calculation for one other field. Um, as I already said, if you are below 0.2 becquerel, we have no discussion. Below 0.2 becquerel, we have no residues. You are not regulated, you can throw it away. If you are above, then we have one case that's the easiest one. The sum of both, the maximum activity in both decay change. If the sum of the maximum in both decay change below one becquerel per liter, you can use it for recycling or disposal. That means you can recycle it for streets, you can dispose it somewhere for landfill, whatever it is. That's the regulation what <coughs> German states. So some excludes about the mass per year and something else, the area that you're covered with this disposal. But in the easiest way you can say, if you're below one becquerel, you can just <coughs> dispose it. So that's, that's a very easy thing, but you, have, you see uh, that's a maximum activity of both decay change and summed up. It's very simple, very easy to, to take. What you have to do if you have more than 5,000 tons a year, we split it to half. Because if you have a big mass load, uh, the impact of the environment is, is, is greater. <coughs> and there are some other uh, things which are excluded from. For there are some restrictions if you, resent, if you build a bit of house with it. So if you also a reduction a little bit more, because I want to be in living houses. So if you use your residues for uh, a cement factory or something like that, then you probably have to go in lower values. Because we probably will see it once back in our, in our house. <coughs> what is in think the case if you go on very, very high areas, on one hectare? where you cover with, with this material, or what is regulated in Germany, if you have a catchment area for usable groundwater. So if you just dispose your material on top, where we get our groundwater for drinking, then they go down to 0.2 becquerel, because they are afraid. But if you go on this level, you have no residue, there's no limitation. I hurry up. It's come now the worst thing. That's the worst thing what it can happen. Um, if you are above this level, you are allowed to store it with up to an activity of 5 becquerel per gram in a normal underground storage. So if I'm normally talking about radioactive waste, we have no storage, long-term storage for radioactive waste in Germany. It's not why we cannot build it, because it's no political will to build it. That's a political issue. But we have a mass underground storages for chemical hazards. And if you are below 5 becquerel per gram, you can store it in an underground lab where you store normal, an underground facility where you store chemical hazards. Because that's no radioactive things. And the worst thing what can happen, um, no standard case, I already mentioned, you have to do the calculation. If you see, I look on your plant, you are very close to the sea. The water has not a long flow way to the sea, I guess, it's only some kilometers. So maybe it's for years ago, it's a possibility to use this calculation way if you use the German regulation, because you probably can have higher release levels. But then you have to go through all the calculation to prove that you're still below one millisievert, if you not use a standard case. And what happens if you have radioactive waste? Yeah, that's a problem. Then you need a storage for long-term storage for radioactive waste, which is not available in Germany at the moment by a political will. And I can't say what it will cost you. Millions? Billions? I don't have any answer. And that's the reason why many people in the norm field, talking about natural radioactive material, will be afraid to get in this way. They control everything to be below 5 becquerel per gram. Um, as I talked already about norm and building materials, we have to take into account that normal occurring radioactive materials everywhere. It's also in the stone where it's brick where we build our houses. So what we need and what we have in Europe and have also in China, we have regulations which give us values for decision how much could the activity be from the nature 
you use it for building our houses. And there's a difference, especially much more easier to read the China, China standard. So I can recommend you, if you are able to read Mandarin, take the China standard. I have also got an English translation, but it's only half translated. <laughs> The rest was written in Mandarin, but I had some translator helping me to get the rest. I just think it's much more easier than this one. Uh, so I have a regulation very simple. So divide it in mass material, so divide it in fancy things, tiles, something like that, and so divide it about material that you use in your garden. And then you set levels, and I think it's also necessary to talk about natural materials which are building in our houses to reduce the dose. Because final, the dose. That's the problem what you have to talk on. And just summarize a little bit, radiation risk from various is controllable. And I think liners do everything to control them. In the moment, as I saw, installed monitors which are proper, there's nothing to think about. Uh, the German regulation body sees no risk for workers. Residues in rare earth needs a control. Um, the disequilibrium and decay chains have to be taken into account. You cannot focus only on uranium and thorium. So it's only the feeding of the, inst uh, of the installation. We have to look on where everything is going out. And if the control is properly done and the storage is done, you can see that uh, for standard cases we have solutions to store them, to reuse them, or even to build houses with the residues. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Anyone wants to ask a question? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Firstly, I'm inquiring from USM. Uh, maybe first thing, I would like to disappoint uh, the chairman that I, I'm, I'm not from the engineering uh, facility, but medical facility. Oh, yeah. But we are brothers because we all <laughs> produce things uh, for the human consumption, right? Right, so we are taking care of the other part. I, I would like just to comment that uh, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, we welcome and uh, second the idea. We welcome second the idea of uh, you know linking together and you know, research in especially the safety and health aspects of, of what we are doing now. And I think this should sort of uh, relax a bit the sentiments of the public uh, that we we, sh we go forward, uh, you know, with, with this uh, idea of, of looking at safety and health. Uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in the rare earth industry. Um, my second question, I thought, uh, is actually, I was curious about the um, progress in research of Pogian and um, uh, Lip, uh, uh, Mr. Lipton and others, that um, what are the progress, how much, uh, the extent of progress of, of cereal and, and, and latinums in the use, and uh, if, if ever, our university, so we forward is to look into the the research into the use uh, more use application of uh, serum lanterns because it, has, it is uh, the bulk of the production of the separation, right? So uh, and and uh, the price in the near, near future, this this could be one of the uh, things that uh, our nation and university can pick up. Thanks, Senator. Before I open it to the other speaker, I want to have questions which are directed to uh, to Crystal. Uh, you know, and any question? Yes, please. I'm Asna from UG. Come. Okay, uh, I'm Asna from UG. Actually, I, I, uh, I would like to know, actually, uh, how did you handle uh, your Radioactive waste uh, from your lab. Um, what we do is we separate um, our radioactive waste uh, depending on the level of the lab that we are dealing with. As I mentioned, we normally work with environmental samples, so means environment has low low activity contents. So what we split it up our labs in, in labs where we deal closed in boxes materials, and we split it up in, in labs where we have open healing. And we split it to open labs where we have open radioactivity means really open, very open the bottle for higher activities. And the higher activities are going for processing plant as a radioactive waste in any home, no matter what the content, because the control of the waste will be too expensive. So that means we go in separate. And the other labs which are loaded are only this closed box is handling. Uh, there we do uh, measurement, we, set, we collect surveys, we do a measurement. 
be your measurement there, and you have sent the possibility to free release it as, as normal base if you are below the limits. That's regulated with the radiation detection limits. Okay, uh, may I know, is there any uh, 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 point in this that um, actually receive your final sample of your list? Is there anybody that uh, control uh, your waste? Your waste? Yeah, yes. So yes, of course. Um, so that German uh, regulation is very tough. Just if I want to get it, rid of my waste as normal waste, um, first of all, I need a permit to do the control. So that means that's the government land. Okay. We, have, we have a standard permit for standard waste. So we have described how we do our control. And 10% of the control is a joint. What we have in Germany is this an external company. It's a TEV. I don't know what it is in other languages because it's not known around the world. So that's an external company which has the, the possibility to come to us to take their own sample, to make their own measurements. And 10% of our waste controls are controlled by themselves. And report to the government. The government becomes twice the results and one from my lab and one done from the external company. But this is usual in Germany for all releases, even wastewater releases, exhausting air releases are controlled sometimes by governmental uh, owned companies, sometimes by external green companies. So that's usual. Then always I have to report first. So it means my results are ready by the government. And then the control results are presented to me as well. So, please, please. Yeah, uh, I'm still perturbed. Uh, okay. You are, yeah, you are sorry, our Ministry of Health. Yes, okay. but not officially. I mean, I came on my own. All right. Uh, I just want to know about this uh, waste huh, from Red Earth. Although you said that it is not regulated, but there was a that, uh, statement in the audience that said if it's less than 0 0.2 barrels per gram, it's fine. You can throw it into the sea, or I mean, and you need it. You want it meant so you know, don't have to bother about it. But more than 0 0.2 macros, there has to be regulation. So, in this um, red earth factory or company or whatever that's coming up in Malaysia, do they have to keep on doing measurements, or do they do a one-off measurement and say, okay, it's fine, let's not bother about it? I would like to know, please. Thank you. So, um, as I already said, and you are right, uh, in, in Germany, if you are natural radioactive content is below 0.2 becquerel, at maximum in both decations. So, at maximum in both decations. It means each nuclide, the maximum value of a one nuclide in decation must be below 0.2 becquerel. So, you can have below the rate is below, and I'm fine, you have to look on each nuclide and make proof that each nuclide is below 0.2. And if this is true, you can do that's the waste what you want, it's regular waste, it's not regulated. And if you are master, you have to do a proper control. And as I will appear so I'm not an expert in reverse chemistry, but I assume that the process that is running is stable. It will produce always the same waste. But that means you have to control it as I already mentioned at the beginning a little bit more detail. And afterwards, miners should probably control the samples by release, and I think they're planning it already to do measurement before releasing the so waste. So each sample of each release should be controlled on, on the critical point where you use the release. That is my adjustment, but that would be happening in Germany as well. Okay, now another point is, one of the earliest speakers in the he said that uh, cerium and lanthanum, if I'm not mistaken, is going to be overcrowded market. So in case uh, Linus decides to go to heavy production or heavy rare earths, will there be another, or will it be the same residue that you'll get? Um, if they want to go into heavy rare earth production, they would have to design a different facility. The, the facility that is there now is specifically designed to manage or process the amount of oil deposit or something similar to the Mount Well deposit. Um, yeah. If you go into heaviest deposit like South China clay, it's 3-4% cerium. The process is set up to handle 50% cerium. So it's a completely different. If you go into North China, which handles similar materials to Mount Well, when you go into South China, the plant's design is very, very different. So they can't you know, there is no one-size-fits-all rare processing facility uh, in the world today. You, you 
customize it for the basic feed material. Uh, so yeah, I don't see them shifting into heavies unless they uh, develop, say, the Duncan deposit, which is next door, but then they would need a different processing plant. Okay. Last question, Mr. Chairman. There's water question. You said you put, they didn't have enough water. Are you saying that in Baha, I mean, in Malaysia, we have lots of water? From what we were told yesterday, um, yes, the, uh, let me just grab it. Um, as I understand it, they need 500 cubic meters per hour, and in Perth, uh, to get that sort of uh, flow rate was a concern. Uh, the, the difference, too, is the cost. In Perth, it was six ringgit per cubic meter. In uh, Malaysia, 0.84. Thank you. Uh, can I just answer the question about university collaboration? So the, uh, from our study, up, after our study, we did get some money from government to do pre-feasibility study or desktop study. So we have tied on the, uh, uh, the, the mine, mining resource uh, mapping. But basically, it's on uh, tin mining, and then the entry point is about clear up, you know, from the tin hailing. So this is ongoing. Uh, this is a, a desktop study to see whether what potential we have. Then the second study that was uh, uh, mentioned was about this, uh, you know, thinking of universities, which is human resource uh, development. Uh, from R and D at the top end of uh, of real earth industry down to vocational training, and this one we have been actually in discussion with the China Real Earth Society, and then on our side here we are now actually uh, developing in the consortium of universities the curriculum. First thing about the R and D side, but also about mining of mining, like uh, producing mining engineers. But we have also been to uh, the uh, Ministry of Human uh, of Human Resources, which are in charge of vocational training, that uh, they should now, at least in, in the uh, vocational training institute in Paham, that you know they should now basically focus also, the, the handling of you know real earth material and all this, because if we are talking about downstream industry, uh, they are going to come. Then a lot of the accessory will be supplied by SMEs, and the SMEs are not about getting PhDs, R and D, you know, researchers, or even about engineers, but actually about craftsmen. And, uh, and, and skill, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, labor force, the trained labor force that will service those uh, uh, industries. Now, why, why we are asking uh, uh, UMP to be the hub? Because they are so near. They are so near uh, the line, liners uh, plant. Uh, but at the present moment, the four universities that's forming the consortium, Besides, uh, you know, UMP is Utah. You know, uh, that is because of the Chinese connection, the Utah. But also, they have a, a, a group on real earth. Then, uh, University Petronas and also University uh, Malaysia Malacca. So, because uh, University Malacca has been asked by Modi Minister to try to have a, a curriculum to to have. Uh, what we call a, a mining engineering department, not necessarily in Malacca, but at least to develop it. And, but we find that they are, they are expertise scattered. So we are trying to say that let's get all these universities and pool their, their equipment, their human resources, uh, researchers and then together. And then, then we ask China to, you know, to try to uh, how shall we to review our curriculum and make recommendations about what you know about the equipment that we need and what sort of human resources we need and of course the human resources we need will be maybe initially dependent on from China the the, the faculty members from China and then sending our own students or researchers to China to be trained there. 
But the other very important initiative that we are we have now asked government is that we must do a baseline health study. The baseline health study actually uh, around the plant, around the Kwantan community, and that one, the baseline study must be long term, like any baseline health study, and it is best done in the university or university uh, related environment because it has got to be independent to be to be acceptable. And that one, uh, since uh, UMP already have some uh, collaboration with KIT, we are trying to strengthen this collaboration about the baseline health study. But on top of that, we are also recommending to government that government should clean up the Irving Industrial Complex. Because in the world, there are many, many clean up of uh, chemical industrial complexes about the air, about the, the, the efferents on the rivers, and just the what you call whatever noise pollution and all. And we feel that uh, if we use the uh, Irving Industrial uh, Complex as a pilot, <laughs> And you know when we do one, then you spread this to other petrochemical complex because a lot of them are, were built in the 80s at the time the technology, you know, the standards and all that were low. Now that we have come up to the first decade of the 21st century and we experience overseas, we want to ask our men, please, you know, clean up the, the petrochemical complex, you know, so that. The, the communities around the petrochemical compact that you be restored, the environment will be restored back to before the petrochemical complex was established. So, so the uh, our academy science in Malaysia and the National Professors Council are pursuing all this. You know, so getting the government to say that let us go forward, let's go forward and then make Malaysia if we want to be uh, you know, high income, developed, industrialized nation, it must be green and clean. Any any comment? I would like to comment on that too. Because uh, people always think uh, negatively about this radiation thing impact on the health. You should also include the good thing about this impact. You know, there might be a radiation boost for health. So that should be included also in the study. Uh, question for Christophe. For, for I just want to clarify, just maybe just for the comfort of all of us. Is, is it okay? Yeah, you can go ahead. The next speaker. Okay. The next speaker one. Okay. Uh, can, can we say that Christophe, that for example, the exposure for nuclear power plant, for mining area, and maybe from the industrial area like the methods in giving the, 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 the exposure will be different. I mean, if you are talking about three different things, because you mentioned about the in Germany, for example, a nuclear power plant. So, because it's sometimes it's a mix, it's a, 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 a kind of a confusion. When we talk about radiation, we are thinking about nuclear power plant. It, it's only like to, to, to make it clear, is it the exposure for nuclear power plant, the exposure for mining? So, if we talk about mining yesterday, what it's a long period people are exposed to the mining and also the exposure to what you see in the you saw in the line as yesterday. I mean maybe you can help to us. Second, my second question is on the residues. You mentioned in your slide just now that there is some residues that can be used in construction materials. I mean something like below certain thing, below certain certain value, but also is it the same in, in Germany where in UK and US they were they, they were telling us that they are also being used if your 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 level is five micrograms per gram, it can be used a baseline for a base material for the low construction. Is this such law or such things in Germany on that okay? So let's go to the first question. Um, let's talk about uh, exposure or let's talk about risks. That's a big question. Because if you talk about exposure, then the exposure in mining is the highest. Mining. If you talk about exposure. But if you talk about risk, it's a problem of nuclear power plant. It's not the operation of that. The problem is if something going wrong, as we saw several times already in our world. And then we have a high exposure. That's the risk, what we talk about. So then 
kernel is not comparable to any processing pipelines. Because in Linux we have material coming from the nature, the concentrations are low, and there is no such risk. So that's what we have to separate a little bit in the discussion is risk. Not only exposure. And the problem with the power plant is that's a big dish issue as high activity levels, high concentrations producing radioactivity yeah, and have a risk to come out of control. And then you have a high exposure. So that's how it's not in the real world. But if you talk about exposures, and I'm, I'm not an expert in real world, but I'm an expert in radiation, radiation protection. And I read a lot of articles about exposure in in former times, especially in my facilities, also in Malaysia. With also some research project going, going on here in Malaysia already. So I had read a lot of things about that. And we can overcome these problems by measurements, by better regulations, because the problem in mining was radon and the radon dollars. And if you have a lot of ventilation with high radon concentrations, uh, if the radon dollars are mothers are there. So, so the feeding that you get a high rate of concentrations in mining and therefore you find a lot of free pumps. I never found, so far I did my research, something about rare births and exposures. I found a lot of papers dealing with residues and how to store them and what is the potential risk. I always read only potential risks. I never saw a paper dealing about non-material material and radiation cancer. So, but I, you can find a lot of papers about mining. But it's gone already because we get rid of this problem by better control, by better measurement techniques, and by better uh, installations. So that's what we have to separate. And for the first question. And the second question I did not catch it so fast. <laughs> is is there a residue or number from the residue that have this uh, can be used in, I mean, what is the Is there such kind of law or regulation? Um, the law uh, regulations I showed you everyone. So, but what I showed is the law we have in Germany. And as I write on my slides, I have my slides on here at the moment. I have to my slides probably. <laughs> so, let's say the rate value. For for the case you want to make a screen, it's, we have recycling, it's, it's a recycling place with one decorator from. But if you can show that the use what you are doing is below one millisiever, then you can do everything. But it is your task to show that. Because this given in the law are standard cases. So they have to take care of not only about rubber, they have to take care of mineral oil industries, they have to take care of less industry, they have to petrol chemistry, everything. So they have to cover everything in the law. The standard case works in any law. So in rubber, it's not a standard case. So they have a separation of elements, and therefore this law will cover this. But it overestimates the risk. So that means that Linus will use it in Germany, and they can prove by a university study that it is fine and make up the complication that they can show that it's below my BC was a reuse. So fine. And I'm not sure if we have such regulations in Great Britain or France, because I'm not sure that uh, non material is regulated in European Communion Global. Not regulated means that it's not a law or the way to do it. I give the last thing to the lady and I guess we're waiting patiently for a long time. Okay. Um, hi, uh, Ping from Telegraph again. Uh, I would like to ask about the, uh, the waste management because Linus claims that it can dilute its waste from six becquerel to one becquerel. Uh, and it claims it can recycle all its residue. So um, maybe this question could, can be directed to Professor uh, Yen. Whether is it feasible? Has it been done before? Uh, because the IAEA recommended that uh, Lina should have a permanent waste disposal facility. So uh, is it safer to have a facility, or is it uh, is it possible to recycle all the rest? Oops. all the residue, because this is a major concern among the communities that are opposing this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and you uh, you ask me to to, to answer. And um, to the point, I think that I cannot directly to answer your question because I haven't the detailed processing meter, uh, uh, parameters for how to decrease or uh, decrease the, uh, the, the concentration. Uh, the concentration of solids from about 6 uh, BQ uh, per gram to 1 uh, BQ per gram, right? However, I think that I uh, just I mentioned uh, during the, the Monday's uh, seminar or symposium, I, I have the questions to, uh, to, to liners. And even they uh, uh, have done well, and they should release the, the, the data about the class balance in the food process step by step. Because after then, the public can calculate and accumulate which one, uh, which uh, uh, products or pro uh, uh, byproducts, even the residues, the exact uh, content, uh, the, the content, or exact concentration and, and the volume of the solid. So that can convince the public. Also convince them the, 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 the science and technology uh, uh, community. So it's yeah. an it's an open uh, practice to me. And uh, in addition, I think that uh, to uh, to date, Linus process uh, is only under uh, under construction, and they didn't uh, open the process or starting the cascade and try the, the not to try it, and utilize the, the the facilities for the post treatment of all of the wastes, right? So during their uh, during their production of producing the products, and I think that they should to, uh, to continually uh, in, uh, 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 in situate and uh, in real time styles to control and detect or track the amount of the sodium and also other others. Besides the sodium as the fluent, uh, a fluent and also the, the acidity gas and the F, that's a fluoride content, content gas and others, is also the necessary issue and necessary fact to be detected during the production. That's what you commented. That's what you commented also a little bit. Um, in Germany, it's not regulated what a company or factory is doing with the material. A normal It means the sliders like to recycle it in their own process, in their own facilities, they can do what they want. And if they want to get rid of the radioactivity and pre-concentrated or whatever, as long as they stay in the factory, that's fine. But that's another law, a German law. So the one I think would be also very good to think if this would be another law here, is to dilute it just down so you get a lower level. Because that's not the way what we do in radiation safety. Radiation safety means what we have is what we have. And if the process is like the process, they get rid of the material, it's fine. But it's to dilute it to make just take a clear water and put it in the in the in the dirt water and get it more clear. That's not the way what we do what we do with residuals and with radiation systems. So that should be not in the discussion. But if the process is such designed that you can get the lower material levels, that's fine. And that's the way what we do in Germany as well. We design the process. And if you get a low residue content, then it's okay. Uh, we are in injury time, so I think really over the injury time. So I have to utterly close uh, uh, the days. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, no, no, uh, you can ask. Uh, so if I, uh, no, 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 please. I, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm closing. Uh, please. I'm, I got the chair. Because we are 15 minutes over time, and our, our international speaker is part of the engagement. So, uh, what I would like to really mention is that, that uh, the ASM in the website is not only having the study report, but the proceedings of uh, 
these three days, that are the, real. Uh, the, uh, the presentation of all our speakers will be on our website, on our website. And, and also we are opening a web consultation in the ASM website. So if you have got any questions that you, you think about after you leave here, or like you that uh, is not allowed because of time constraint, please post it on the web discussion of the ASM. And then if you get uh, the, uh, the international speakers, they will agree that they will respond to your, your question. And their response will be open to everyone. And we hope that this this web uh, consultation you can avoid it because I think mean, it is uh, the obligation of the scientific community as represented by ASM and the NPC to continuing having this this uh, dialogue with the community. And I must say that this is the first time that we are engaging the community in such a way. So please, uh, if you have any question, you know, any comments, please go into our web consultation. Now the other one, the other one I want to just make uh, a comment. You know that our Prime Minister has announced that we are setting up a Malaysian China Industrial Park in Gerbing, which is 185 hectares. Now this is a, a, what we call the sister industrial park to the China Malaysia Industrial Park in, in Qingzhou. So this, this agreement was signed between Premier Wen Jiabao of China and our Prime Minister Dato uh, Sri Najib Nurasa last month in China. But what I want to say is that this industrial park in uh, in, in Gerbing actually open the way for us to tap into the expertise of China in, in, in their development of real earth upstream, downstream from uh, separating plant and also refinery and down, downstream industry, that's one. But the other thing that I want to emphasize is that I've seen many, many industrial parks or, or technology parks, uh, uh, especially in developing country, that actually become just like rental, you know, property development, you rent space. But the only one that I really impressed with is the Sinju Technology Park in Taipei, Taiwan. Why is it they are so successful? They are now the hub of high tech, you know, computer industry. It's because it is anchored by two universities. One is the Tsinghua Taiwan University, one is the Jiaotou University, and also E3, the, the Industrial Technology Research Institute. And they really have very close collaboration with startup companies and continue to have this uh, uh, industry and and, uh, and uh, what called academia uh, collaboration. So again, it is for ASM to input to government that if this uh, Malaysia China, if this Malaysia China industrial park in Gerbing is to succeed, it must build in the, the train and high skill capital. With, with university and research establishment within the area or just outside the park. If we don't pay attention to that aspect of human capital development, the industrial park actually will fail. Because the, the purpose of the industrial park is to go for high-tech cutting-edge industry. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for attending this morning's in, in the lecture discourse and ask all of you to join me in thanking our four speakers.